Hello students, good evening all. I hope you all are doing great. Well, uh, we'll be understanding the important news articles of 16th of May 2022 and I'm your educator Prithvi Singh. Let us begin with the live streaming of this session. So on the very front page of the Hindu, there was an article about a historic win of the Indian badminton team, the men's badminton team for the first time in the history Indian contingent have won the Thomas Cup. Now Thomas Cup is for men's badminton and for the first time Indian contingent or Indian men's team has won this prestigious title Thomas Cup and they have defended none other than the six time 14 time champion Indonesia by 3-0. Now this event took place in Bangkok and it was India's maiden success in this prestigious tournament. Now students, they may ask you the question that Thomas Cup belongs to which of the following uh, sports? So Thomas Cup is with, it belongs to badminton. Right. And in fact, it is team badminton. I mean, it's a team event. It's a team event. So Indian man's team also participated in the Thomas Cup at uh, Bangkok and they have won this title for the first time and they have they have defeated 14th time 14 time champion Indonesia. So very big success a very important success for Indian men's badminton team Thomas Cup right. So I strongly expect a question on this Thomas Cup. So this is an Indian contingent as you can see on the screen. The Thomas Cup winners, badminton, defeating Indonesia. And this is the first success of Indian team at Thomas Cup. So very important news article. Moving to the next news, which says that only one state can decide on remission. Now students, in the previous uh, DNA sessions, we did discuss about the powers or the judicial powers of president we talked about pardon commutation remission respite and reprieve now one among the judicial powers is called as remission now in remission if you want to go through my previous dna sessions you'll find that the time period is altered because there are two things which are altered either the time period or the character of the punishment. For example, in commutation, the nature or the character of the punishment is changed. For example, the death sentence has been commuted to life imprisonment. So that is called as changing the nature, right? Now remission is a judicial power where the president under article 100 and governor uses the remission powers the time frame of the punishment for example 20 years of rigorous imprisonment has been remitted to 10 years of rigorous imprisonment in this case the nature of the punishment which is rigorous imprisonment let's say ke saja. so rigorous imprisonment so the nature of the punishment is still same but what has changed is the time frame from 20 years it has been reduced to 10 years correct and remission powers is there with the president excised by the president under article 72 and by the governor under article 161 right now, after the uh, the plea by the Tamil Nadu government uh, over deciding over the uh, you know the acquittal of uh, I mean I will not call acquittal but at least uh, using the remission powers over the Rajiv Gandhi killer is there uh, uh, you know in the news they, it is making the news so therefore this article again surfaced remission or premature release of a convict has to be considered in terms of the policy applicable in the state where the crime was committed right 
and not where the trial was transferred to and concluded right so in this sense remission or premature release would be considered in terms of the policy of the state in which the crime is committed for example rajiv gandhi assassination happened in the state of tamil nadu right that means rajiv gandhi was assassinated in the um, in the in tamil nadu so therefore it would be under the territorial jurisdiction of tamil nadu right however the case was transferred to supreme court correct so it is saying that it the i mean the, the the remission of a convict would be considered in terms of the policy of the state in which the crime was committed and not where the trial was transferred to and concluded it happens guys that in many cases let's say the crime is committed in the, in rajasthan but then the it, uh, you know the the trial was transferred to gujarat uh, and it was also concluded in gujarat right so but then the law or would apply only for of the state where the crime was committed and the state in our case was rajasthan right so so the bench of justices ajay rastogi and vikram nath said that section 432 of crpc 1973 because crpc uh, 432 clause 7 of crpc also talks about the remission or premature release of a convict there cannot be a concurrent jurisdiction of two state governments on the issue of remission right so here uh, is very it is very important section 4, 432 rpc it says that there cannot be concurrent jurisdiction of two state governments over the issue of remission let us understand with the case now uh, the top court was hearing a plea by a convict seeking direction to the state government of state of gujarat you know and that means the crime took place the offense took place in gujarat the crime was committed in gujarat but the top court in 2004 had transferred the case to mumbai maharashtra due to the peculiar facts and circumstances of the case right now the top court said in the instant case that once the crime was committed in gujarat after the trial concluded and judgment of conviction came to be passed all further proceedings have to be considered including remission or premature release as the case may in terms of the policy which is applicable in the state of gujarat where the crime was actually committed and not the state where the trial stands transferred and concluded for exceptional reasons under the orders of the court right so in this sense it should be very clear jis state ke andar crime hua hai ya offense hua hai us state ke jo laws hai us state ki jo policies hai wo applicable hogi when the governor or president is using the remission powers correct and na ki us state mein jahan pe ye case transfer hua hai right so it is also mentioned there in section 432 of crpc now moving to the editorial page well there was an interesting article about uh, section 124a which is sedition law in ipc and we all know that the central government is reviewing section 124a of ipc and the the apex court has stayed any uh trials you know with respect to section 124a till the time the government comes up with any review right so and this case which has put section 124a which talks about sedition or which has stayed say, section 124a have put section 124a in abeyance is sg vom vombat kere versus union of india a very important case students and i expect a question on this so we all know that section 124a has been put to stay till the time the central government reviews its decision over 124a or sedition law we know students that section 124a has been misused by the government and it is a tool which is being used by the government to curb the freedom of speech to curb any dissent against the government well it was a colonial law as you all know introduced by a british officer thomas macaule and introduced in ipc in the year 1860 but then it was to curb any hate speech by words or uh, in written form or in visual representation 
which may incite violence against the government which may incite you know hatred against the government it was being misused abused by the british authorities against many political leaders like mahatma gandhi bal gangadhar tilak v d savarkar so on and so forth even after independence many governments in india have misused section 124a correct but at the same time there is a conflict between article 19 clause 1 sub clause uh, uh, a which sub clause i which is which talks about freedom of speech and expression and section 124a now there was various cases like kedarnath case kedarnath case of 1962 where the court actually you know validated section 124a but at the same time said that it has to be sparingly used that means it put limitations on section 124a in this sense it said that sedition law would be used only when any action by the people results into incitement of violence against the government or disturbance of public order or public peace but then also these terms are very vague and the government has time and again misused section 124a to curb any dissent against the government now this case in supreme court sg wombat kere versus union of india which actually put a stay over section 124a till the time government reviews the colonial law and this case very important and i expect a question on this sg wombat kere versus union of india which effectively suspended the operation of section 124a and as we all know that it was being used to suppress the democratic dissent where the court has directed the governments both at at the level of the union and the states to keep all pending trials appeals and proceedings arising out of a charge framed under section 124a in abeyance right sabko hold pe rakh diya hai jab tak ki central government ka iske upar koi decision nahi aa jata although we know that we know that section 124a attracts a 3 year uh, to life imprisonment uh, punishment plus fine and it is non bailable but then now it has been put under abeyance now this article at the same time says that uh, i mean it defines section 124a which we have already discussed that it is actually is being used to deal any offenses against the state but the word disaffection is the provision uh, i mean it explains includes it includes this loyalty and all feelings of enmity we know that it is non bailable and it was being used to crush any and every form of opposition aimed at the government so definitely it is a onslaught on article 19 clause 1 sub clause a which is freedom of speech and expression now sedition as a permitted restriction on free speech the court limited its application in kedarnath case as we just discussed but it failed to recognize that terms such as dis disaffection towards the government which are fundamentally vague because disaffection against the government is not something which is actually you know objective it is very subjective and it is very vague now it are it is vague it ought to have no place in a penal statute and that all along the intention behind criminalizing sedition was to quell the right to dissent as i said that the limitations which were imposed in kedarnath case have rarely been observed now it is the most marginalized sections of the society that have actually faced the brunt of uh of this colonial law and since 1973 sedition has also been treated as cognizable offense that means a person can be arrested without an arrest warrant the courts could have treated its earlier verdict as a ruling rendered per incurium that means the court could have 
you know come up with a judgment saying that our uh, our actually uh, decision uh, our verdict you know in kedarnath case is per incurium means it was in ignorance of binding precedent and law now the provision will be kept in abeyance until the government and parliament take a final call on the matter and thus it allows those accused of the offence to both seek bail in terms of the order and to have their trials frozen right in this sense guys the author concludes that even if sedition is let's say being abolished by a parliamentary law in the country but then also there are many laws like uapa or unlawful activities prevention act then there are various preventive detention laws which may be you know used by the government to curb any dissent against it right so therefore there is a holistic reform which is required now from this article the takeaways are number 1 sg vombat kere versus union of india now this is a famous case which wherein supreme court put an stay over section 124a or you know suspended the operation of section 124a which is sedition as the vombat kare versus union of india second is definitely kedarnath case of 1962 which limited the use of section 124a and how uh, state also has still many tools like uapa and the preventive detention laws to curb the free speech so this is what i have explained it as the vombat kare versus union of india very very important as i say that as i explained that it is it was thomas macole which who actually you know uh, drafted section 120 uh, section 124a in the year 1837 and it was inserted in 1870 uh, you know by sir james stephen right now there are many other cases like the supreme court highlighted debates over sedition in 1950 in its decisions in bridge bhushan versus state of delhi romesh thapar versus state of madras and in all these cases the court held that a law which restricted speech on the ground that it would disturb public order was unconstitutional right so in this sense any law which restricted the speech on the ground that it would disturb the public peace public order is unconstitutional as held in bridge bhushan versus state of delhi so there are many cases bridge bhushan versus state of delhi plus ramesh thapar versus state of madras so this court ne clearly kaha tha ki aisa koi bhi tool jisse freedom of speech and expression restrict hota hai wo actually unconstitutional hai on the ground that it would disturb public order is unconstitutional similarly uh, kedarnath we have already discussed right and in 1995 the supreme court in balwant singh versus state of punjab held that mere sloganeering which evoked no public response did not amount to sedition to yahan pe bhi ek court ne stand liya tha ki mere sloganeering keval slogans wagera aap raise karte ho government ke against aur jisse koi public response evoke nahi hota hai वो भी सिडिशन नहीं कहलाएगा राइट सो इन दिस सेंस देर आर केसेज विच कर्ब दी अब्यूज ऑफ सेक्शन 124 ए लाइक बलवंत सिंह वर्सेज स्टेट ऑफ पंजाब एंड देन रोमेश थापर वर्सेज स्टेट ऑफ मद्रास एंड ब्रिज भूषण वर्सेज स्टेट ऑफ दिल्ली एट द सेम टाइम केदारनाथ सिंह ऑल्सो लिमिटेड द स्कोप ऑफ हंड्रेड ट्वेंटी फोर ए बट देन द प्रॉब्लम इज दैट दे आर नॉट बींग प्रॉपरली यूज uh the the court rulings are not being properly used by the government and time and again government has you know flaunted section 124a and to curb any dissent against the government moving to the next news article about the marital rape exception now guys all the articles today are you know they are from the legal domain and in the legal section they may ask you about marital rape exception they may ask you about sedition law right so very very important marital rape exception guys we all know that recently the delhi high court has come up with split verdict 
over marital rape exception. We know that section 375 which talks about rape has a exception which is section 2. So section 2 of 375 talks about the exception to this rape or to this offence and this is called as marital rape exception. Now it has been in uh, news for many uh, past few months and still uh, it is not a crime in India. Although Karnataka High Court declared marital rape as a crime but Supreme Court is yet to give its decision. Now the author tries to explore marital rape exception in terms of article 14 or the constitutional constitutionality of the exceptions in terms of article 14. Students we all know article 14 has two components equality before law plus equal protection of laws. Equality before law means all people should be treated equally irrespective of their differences. Even if you are poor or rich you all would be told asked to start from the same starting line if it is a 100 meter race. Whereas equal protection of laws says that equal must be treated equally. For example, you cannot have same law for a lion and a wolf in the jungle. You cannot have a same law for a 15 year child and a 5 year child. And that is the reason why even in OBC community there is a concept of creamy layer. Those who are earning above 8 lakh are not given reservation. right? So you have a same community but in that also there is differential class those who are earning above 8 lakh. Right? So it is called an equal protection of laws which is a American concept. Now this right does not absolutely preclude differential treatment of two classes of persons. It seeks to ensure simply speaking that like classes are treated alike. Very important statement guys, like classes must be treated alike. For example, those earning above 8 lakh in OBC must not be given reservation. Right. So this is your like class, a class above 8 lakh and those below 8 lakh must be availed reservation. Right. So in this sense it has been in this sense like classes are being treated alike. So this is the second provision of article 14 which is equal protection of laws. Now one of the tests which is which was being prescribed by the Supreme Court for article 14 is that of reasonable classification. Now the reasonable classification test, reasonable classification, it has two prongs that is it has two prong it is a two prong test the first is where two classes of persons are treated differently you know it must be established that they are indeed distinguishable from each other and this is condition of intelligent intelligible differentia intelligible differentia right for example you must differentiate between an adult and a child. Right. So for example differentiating an adult versus a child. The requirement of a child let's say a 5 year child is different from an adult which is let's say who is a 25 years old. Right. So the requirement of a 5 year child is different from a 5 year adult. So therefore there must be different laws for child and that for adult. So this is a intelligible differentiation, correct. Whereas we talk about equality before law, in that sense all should be treated equally irrespective of uh, their differences, right. But we know that they are different classes in the same sect, in the same community. So like classes must be treated alike because the requirement of five year child is different from that of 25 year adult. So therefore there must be two laws, separate laws applicable for child and for adult and this differentiation is called as intelligible differentiation. So this is the test of article 14 ka, ki intelligible differentiation hona chahiye. Second hai, 
कि ये जो इंटेलिजिबल डिफरेंस डिफरेंसीशन है इसका इट शुड हैव अ क्लोज नेक्सस और लॉजिकल रिलेशन बिटवीन अ लॉ विच ट्रीट द टू क्लासेस डिफरेंटली एंड द ऑब्जेक्ट और पर्पज ऑफ द लॉ लेट से द लॉ इज विद रिगार्ड टू द चाइल्ड लेबर नाउ द लॉ से इज दैट आई मीन द पर्पज ऑफ द लॉ इज डेफिनेटली द प्रोटेक्शन ऑफ चिल्ड्रन एंड दिस लॉ प्रोहिबिट द चिल्ड्रन फ्रॉम परफॉर्मिंग डेंजरस लेबर अब यहाँ पर हमने एडल्ट और एडल्ट और चाइल्ड के बारे में डिफ्रेंसिएशन किया तो चाइल्ड शुड चिल्ड्रन शुड बी प्रोहिबिटेड फ्रॉम डूइंग यू नो फ्रॉम परफॉर्मिंग डेंजरस लेबर फॉर एग्जाम्पल चिल्ड्रन वर्किंग इन सम एक्सप्लोजिव फैक्ट्री यू नो विच इज एक्चुअली मैन्युफैक्चरिंग बॉम्ब्स एक्सेट्रा सो सो दे मस्ट नॉट बी इन्वॉल्व इन डेंजरस लेबर और डेंजरस इम्प्लॉयमेंट सो दिस इज अ डिफ्रेंसिएशन दैट दैट यू डन एंड द ऑब्जेक्टिव ऑफ द लॉ इज प्रोटेक्शन ऑफ चाइल्ड तो इन दोनों का जो इंटेलिजिबल डिफ्रेंसिएशन है इट शुड हैव अ क्लोज नेक्सेस और रिलेशनशिप विद द ऑब्जेक्ट ऑफ द लॉ एंड द ऑब्जेक्ट ऑफ द लॉ इज द प्रोटेक्शन ऑफ चाइल्ड सो देर फॉर दिस डिफ्रेंसिएशन हैज अ क्लोज नेक्सेस और क्लोज रिलेशनशिप विद द ऑब्जेक्ट ऑफ द लॉ विच इज प्रोटेक्शन ऑफ चाइल्ड तो ये कंडीशन जब होगी तब ही ये रीजनेबल क्लासिफिकेशन की कैटेगरी में आएगा तो इस पव्यू को अप्लाई किया है मैरिटल रेप के एक्सेप्शन के अंदर अंडरस्टैंड हाउ दे हैव इंटरपोस्ट इट नाउ इंटेलिजिबल डिफ्रेंसिया ऑफ मैरिटल रेप एक्सेप्शन इज बाय अग्रीमेंट बिटवीन मैरिड एंड अनमेरिड वीमेन तो ये वैलिड है कि मैरिड वीमेन शुड हैव डिफरेंट सेट ऑफ अगेंस्ट द अनमेरिड वीमेन सो इट इज ए इंटेलिजिबल डिफ्रेंसिएशन बट ऑब्जेक्ट ऑफ द लॉ क्या है ऑब्जेक्ट ऑफ द लॉ इज टू पनिश सर्टन सेक्शुअल एक्ट वेन डन विदाउट कॉन्सेंट करेक्ट अगर विदाउट कंसेंट कंसेंट अगर कोई सेक्शुअल एक्ट होता है तो ये इसका ऑब्जेक्टिव है क्या इसके और डिफ्रेंसिएशन uh, के बीच में क्लोज रिलेशनशिप है सो लेट इज एक्सप्लोर दिस मैरिड वीमेन एंड अनमेरिड वीमेन दिस इज अ डिफ्रेंसिएशन इंटेलिजिबल डिफ्रेंसिएशन एंड देर आर डिफरेंट सेट ऑफ लॉज फॉर देम राइट बट ऑब्जेक्ट ऑफ द लॉ ये है कि विदाउट नॉन कंसेंशुअल नॉन कंसेंशुअल सेक्शुअल एक्टिविटी ऑब्जेक्ट ऑफ द लॉ यह है कि नॉन कंसेंशुअल सेक्शुअल एक्टिविटी इज अफेंस अब इसके बीच में क्या क्लोज रिलेशनशिप है नहीं है दैट मीन्स ये आर्टिकल 14 का रीजनेबल क्लासिफिकेशन टेस्ट को फुलफिल नहीं करता है राइट सो इवन इ रेस्पेक्टिव ऑफ अ गर्ल और अ फीमेल हु इज मैरिड और अनमेरिड but if it is a non consensual sexual activity then it would be termed into the category of offence it would be called as offence right so there is no close nexus between the object of the law and the intelligible differentiation correct so therefore marital rape exception under, under section 375 of ipc stands to be flawed as far as this uh, you know classification goes right so in this view what defines right so since there is no rational nexus or
nexus between the uh, i mean uh, the close nexus between the intelligible differentiation and the reasonable classification which does not hold true for the marital rape exception now there are many other views one uh, i mean uh, just justice c hari shankar he says that uh, i mean in fact there is one more ju ju uh, ju judicial view that marriage without marriage within which there is a legitimate expectation of sex because the author says that married relationship ke andar legitimate expectation of sex hota and therefore it materially changes the nature of the act in this view right but there can be no legitimate expectation of forced sex right so there is difference between consensual sex and non consensual sex right exams and upsc so guys this is the data when rape is allowed by law as i said the marital rape exception section 375 ipc more than 2/3 of married women in india aged 15 to 49 have been beaten up or forced to provide sex regardless of their socio economic positions as per the united nation population fund so it is a stalking fact more than 2/3 of the married women are being forced to you know uh, enter into a non consensual sexual activity one in five men has forced his wife or partner to have sex as per the international men and gender equality survey 2011 and over 104 countries across the world have criminalized marital rape india saudi arabia pakistan and china have not right so still india saudi pakistan and china have not yet criminalized marital rape so therefore this article is important and we'll just read it through moving to the next news article the importance of lumbini guys we all know that recently prime minister modi visited lumbini even though since prime minister he is i mean he is one of the prime minister to visit lumbini in the last few decades now he visited a place in uh, in lumbini maya devi temple where it is being said that you know gautam buddha was born so following the middle path and therefore it becomes much more important you know in this world of turmoil where the countries are invading to uh, you know hold their uh, political ideology you know uh, or to dominate their political ideology
<laughs> All right, so in this sense, guys, it's very important visit by Prime Minister. Lumini is the birthplace of Gautam Buddha, and the world should actually take it as an example. His his actual doctrine of following the middle path, neither extremes, nor not too much pleasure, nor too much pain. Right. So the so the path of uh, the middle path, as propounded by Gautam Buddha, uh, the idols of peace, compassion, non-violence, holds true, especially in the present world. And with uh, you know, at the time when there is a growing aggression of China, especially in Lumbini, China has built many monasteries and infrastructure development in Lumbini. So therefore, it is a uh, soft power potential of Buddhism which is being used by by China. Right now, in this article, we have to understand the four places which are important for uh, which are important, you know, uh, in Buddha's life. And the Buddha circuit would also be built over them. That is Lumini, Lumini, Lumini is the birthplace. It is the birthplace of Gautam Buddha. Bodh Gaya is a place where he got enlightenment. Sarnath is a place where he first, you know, gave his sermon or, you know, his, he taught, you know, what he actually, you know, uh, experienced in his enlightenment. As you can see, Sarnath, the first sermon, and then Kushinagar. Where he went into Mahapari Nirvana, where he liberated or he went into Mahapari Nirvana. Right. So these places are very very important, LBSK, Lumbini, Bodh Gaya, Sarnath and Kushinagar. Lumbini is the birthplace of Gautam Buddha, Bodh Gaya is a place in India, where in Bihar, where he got enlightenment, Sarnath, again in India, where he delivered his first sermon and Kushinagar where he experienced Maha Nirvana. Now there are many other places apart from these four but in these four definitely the Buddhist circuit, Buddhist circuit is to be uh, proposed. There are many other places uh, for Buddhist learning like Nalanda, Rajgir and Shravasti. Right. So therefore this visit holds you know high importance uh, all there are no link roads connecting nepal with india so therefore uh, it is an opportunity for the for india to develop the border infrastructure at the same time although we have airports in kushinagar india as well as in bhairava nepal while there are master plan to develop lumbini th there is absence of one glaring in Bodh Gaya. So there is no master plan of development at Bodh Gaya and the, the streets, it's, they are dirty, it is not well organized, there is no master plan. So Bodh Gaya can also learn from the experience of Lumbini with the establishment of a twin, twinning arrangement between the two towns. Right. So Buddhist circuit namely Lumbini, Bodh Gaya and Sarnath Kushinagar to be declared as UNESCO World Heritage Site. Right. So there are proposals that it should be declared as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And India do not have a monastery in Lumbini. Right. Well, this was something which I was looking for. Lumbini and Mahabodh Gaya, Mahabodhi Temple in Bodh Gaya, are UNESCO World Heritage Sites. So this is the second important fact which you should, you should remember. Right? The four sites that we discussed, right? Lumbini, Bodh Gaya, Sarnath and Kushinagar. Usme se Lumbini or Mahabodhi Temple jo hai Bodh Gaya mein, ye dono hi UNESCO World Heritage Sites hai. Ye second important fact is uh, article ka. The third important fact is 
कि ये पूरा जो सर्किट बनना चाहिए जो कि गौतम बुद्धा की लाइफ से एसोसिएटेड है उसको यूनेस्को वर्ल्ड हेरिटेज साइट डिक्लेयर कर देना चाहिए एंड uh, एक इंटरनेशनल कॉन्फ्रेंस होनी चाहिए ऑन द डेवलपमेंट ऑफ बुद्धिस्ट सर्किट सर्किट और इंटरनेशनल म्यूजियम मस्ट बी डेवलप्ड ऑफ बुद्धिस्ट ट्रेडिशन इन बौद्ध गया एंड इन्वाइट ऑल द बुद्धिस्ट कंट्रीज टू पार्टिसिपेट इन इट राइट सो आई होप इट इज क्लियर एंड एन इम्पॉर्टेंट आर्टिकल ऑन इंडिया फॉरन पॉलिसी सो जस्ट गो थ्रू दिस आर्टिकल इट वुड बी वेरी हेल्पफुल फॉर यू सो दट सॉल्व फॉर टूडे आई होप यू इंजॉय द सेशन वी डिस्कस सम इम्पॉर्टेंट न्यूज टूडे विद रिगार्ड टू लीगल करंट अफेयर्स दैट ऑफ सिडिशन मैरिटल रेप एक्सेप्शन देन अ न्यूज अबाउट लुम्बिनी विच इज विथ डील्स विद इंडिया फॉरन पॉलिसी एंड अ बिट ऑफ स्पोर्ट्स सो विश यू ऑल द बेस्ट इन द नेक्स्ट क्लास गुड डे गुड बाय